Uh, welcome to our lovely Zoom event. Um, this the panel that we are going to be discussing, let me get my information back up here. All right, democracy needs a free press. Does democracy need hedge funds? So we are going to be hearing tonight from Evan Brandt, who is a reporter with the Pottstown Mercury and has worked for them for the last 25 years. And he's gonna be addressing questions from his vantage point of a reporter um, and how he has dealt with Arden Global Capital's takeover of his newspaper nine years ago. Right, Evan? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, so this it's, uh, is- It's Alden, not Arden. Alden, I, I, like, I also right. like to put an R in Professor Beckin's name. I'm a little special. <laughs> uh, so I leave it to the four kids who are you know, probably gonna join me at any second now. Um, so, um, this is a joint event between um, the communications department and also the business department. So my students obviously are familiar with hedge funds and we think of them, we think of, oh, billions and uh, TV show. And also that hedge funds are this cool, sexy kind of thing that takes on, you take on a lot of risks and they have a lot less regulations and things like that. But we have a really quick video to introduce to some of the communication students or from students from other disciplines who are not familiar with hedge funds. So our plan was to play that and um, then do some follow-up questions to make sure that all of our participants are in fact paying attention and engaged. Everyone cool with that? Yes? All right. So assuming I can do this without messing up share screen and go to the video. Hold on, no, move this more. Okay, here's our video. There is no sound. There's no sound? No. Okay. All right. Then um, I guess we will stop sharing that. And I will just tell you about hedge funds. <laughs> Okay, so hedge funds, when we say they got their name, because we normally think of hedge, it's not like a hedge in your garden. It's like the concept of hedge your bets, right? So hedge funds, when they were originally created, the idea was that they could take on additional risk. They were less regulated, um, and they were allowed to take on different kinds of investments that would bear more risk than um, the regular type of mutual fund or pension fund, something like that. Now, the flip side of that is because they can take more risk, there's you know large potential upside, but also a huge potential downside. So only well-informed investors were allowed to invest in hedge funds. Um, they are unregulated in terms of what they can invest in. It's not just like stocks and bonds or specific categories of assets like you will see for REIT, which are real estate investment trusts. You can invest in just about anything, anywhere they can potentially make a profit or find something that they can exploit, they're going to do it. So we think of the positive in terms of someone is willing to take on this additional risk and that can be a benefit, but today we're going to hear about the downside of hedge funds. Um, another issue with hedge funds is that they charge a lot. They'll charge 2%, um, usually a general management fee. Then when you get, um, they will take up to 20% of the profits that they get um, from managing the businesses or any of the other um, investments that they're investing in. So we have a poll to make sure that you were following that. Okay. And I will launch that. Okay. Everyone see the poll? Hopefully, because no one's voting. No, oh, there we go. Okay. Shall I? Shall I vote too? I don't know if I let you guys. I, that was an option. You can nope. knock yourself out, Evan. Do you see? I tried. All right. It wouldn't look very good if I didn't answer correctly. Do we have to wait for everyone to do it? Okay. 
Okay. All right, well, we will, uh, so the answer was 20% and um, no, they do not have anything, but okay. All right, um, so Evan, take it away. Okay, well, hi everybody. Um, uh, as, uh, as, you, as you already know, my name is Evan Brandt. I've been a reporter at the Mercury in Pottstown for about 23 years. Um, and uh, I have a whole presentation ready for you. Uh, it's, it's the first time I've done one, so bear with me. And it's a little text intense. Um, so don't feel like you have to read anything. I'll make sure that your professors have a copy of it so that you can look at it afterwards if, uh, if you're interested. But uh, it was better for me to have it all down in front of me so in case I get lost, uh, I can get back to, to where I want to start. Um, I've been asked to tell you a little bit about why I decided to become a reporter. Um, and the answer to that essentially is that uh, I like to question authority and I can question authority and get paid for it as a reporter. Um, and I also have come to understand the important function that it plays in a democracy. Uh, before we get started, I, I wanna talk about this idea of common good um, because most uh, finance firms are involved in making some sort of product or providing a service. And to a certain extent, a newspaper is doing that too. But newspapers and, and media in general, they exist as for-profit companies so they can be independent. That's the most important characteristic about them. It's nice if they make money because then they can be sustainable. But being independent means that they can cover local government, they can cover national government, and uh, they are not bound by being a government agency like the post office or, or being part of the public works department. All of these things provide public good, but you pay for them through taxes and they're part of the broader structure of society. It's important for the press that it be independent so that it doesn't have to worry about any blowback if it decides to expose public wrong. That's why there's a first amendment that protects the press. It's not so that we can report to you about what Kim Kardashian is doing, it's so that we can keep an eye on local government so that we can try and keep them honest so we can expose wrongdoing. And that's one of the vital elements to keep democracy going. And doing it on the local level is particularly important because that's where democracy gets started. All right, so let's see if I can share my screen. There you go. Okay. Um, Um, so local news is dying, at least in terms of newspapers. And uh, that's because they don't make as much money anymore as they used to. And there's no method that's been created to keep them sustained without making money. And we'll get into why they're not making money in a little while and what impact hedge funds have on that. Uh, but here are just some, some quick numbers. Uh, since 2004, uh, more than 2,000 newspapers have closed. And, and that's important because a lot of the places, like the ones that you see on the map, are not covered by big TV stations. They're not near a major metropolitan area. And without those local news sites and local newspapers, there's no one to tell them what's going on. And we'll get into a little bit about why that's a bad thing. So as the map shows, uh, there's almost... Uh, 3,200 counties that have no local news source at all. So why should you care? Um, well, newspapers do a lot of things uh, besides uh, carry uh, the, the comics and your supermarket flyers uh, and besides carrying sports scores. Uh, they have a couple of functions in society that are extremely important. Um, for ex and here, and I've listed a few here in this bullet list. They increase voter turnout. Certainly in this election year, increased voter turnout is something we can all agree is a good thing. And they also, they keep people from just voting the same party from single ticket uh, party. They, they, because it uh, allows readers to be more familiar with the candidate and the issues, they can pick and choose the candidates that they like instead of just going in and voting for all the Democrats and all the Republicans. Um, 
They also, because as I mentioned, we keep an eye on local government and how they're spending your money. Um, they also uh, reduce corruption in government and it actually makes uh, cities and municipalities healthier financially. Um, Wall Street, which in the term of hedge funds is having a hand in destroying local news, also gets paid on the other end of the equation because if uh, a municipality goes out to borrow money in a bond and there is not a local newspaper, Wall Street actually charges them a higher interest rate because the likelihood of inefficiency and the likelihood of corruption is higher without having a local newspaper there to keep an eye on things. Um, so I have a quote here from uh, Josh Benton, which I really like. Uh, local newspapers are basically little machines that spit out healthier democracy. And the best part, is that you get to reap all those benefits whether you're a subscriber or not. So here's an example of how that works. Uh, there is a town outside of Los Angeles called Bell, California. And the local newspaper there was called uh, the Community News. Um, and s sometime in the early 2000s, uh, it went belly up. And what happened then was that the people who ran the city of Bell had a field day. Um, the city manager, pictured here, Robert Rizzo, uh, was literally paying himself $800,000 a year. That's more than the president makes. And it was in a city where, um, let's see, uh, about at least a third or a quarter of the taxpayers lived below uh, the poverty line. So it took the Los Angeles Times, a much larger metropolitan newspaper, to come in once it heard about what was going on there. They conducted an investigation and they found all sorts of improprieties, including Rizzo's salary. And ultimately, uh, the investigation revealed uh, ridiculously high taxes, and also that there were some voter improprieties and perhaps some voter fraud in order to make sure that the right people were getting elected. So ultimately, seven municipal employees and four council members uh, ended up uh, being found guilty of, of fraud and corruption charges. So that's what happens when the local newspaper goes away. So what do I know about that sort of thing? Well, the Mercury has been around much longer than I have. Uh, it was started in the 1930s, and obviously it's been performing this function for a long time, long before I got here. Here are a few examples. Um, the front page there shows uh, 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 articles that ran in the 70s about Tenhurst. Some of you may be familiar with this as a, a Halloween haunt now, which is marginally shameful. Um, because uh, it, it makes, uh, it's called the haunted asylum or something like that. But there were real horrors going on there in the 70s and the Mercury got in there and took pictures and reported on what was going on and ultimately it closed. Uh, there's a, a bullet point here about one of the two Pulitzers we won in 1990. It had to do with the campaign to preserve open space. Um, me, myself, I've done a couple of these things um, in 2001. I don't know how many of you folks are familiar with Pottstown, but you probably know that Montgomery County Community College has a, a West Campus in Pottstown. And the first expansion of that campus uh, into what's called North Hall is into a building that used to be a chemical warehouse. And I found out from the fire chief that the chemicals were being stored so unsafely there that if there was a fire, he would never allow the fire department to actually go in and fight it because it was too dangerous. So a photographer and I climbed up on a railroad embankment. Uh, he shot pictures through the window. I did some document searches and ultimately we got it closed down. And that made the building available for the expansion of the community college, which is a much nicer use downtown. Um, more recently, um, during the pandemic, when everyone began learning online as we're doing here right now, um, my familiarity with Pottstown schools and the fact that they're severely underfunded by the state's education formula uh, led me to realize that uh, in March, when all the schools closed down and all the wealthier school districts shifted easily to online learning, that it was going to be a problem in Pottstown because a lot of the kids in Pottstown didn't have computers at home or enough computers at home or Wi-Fi service. So I wrote about that and that article led directly to a $60,000 donation to the school district to buy Chromebooks for the students. And, uh, and a capital campaign that ultimately collected dollars toward that cause. So now you know why newspapers are good things. Uh, let me tell you that it's not just hedge funds that are killing them, although they may provide the death stroke. Um, 
Newspapers also helped to kill themselves. And this is because they didn't react very well to the internet when it came along. Uh, newspapers at the time were making money hand over fist, and they didn't really think that the internet was anything they need to worry about. If they had websites at all, it was put up as an afterthought. And most importantly, they put it up for free. By the time they realized how much money they were losing, um, there was a whole generation of people who were used to getting content for free and they weren't too crazy about paying for it. The revenue uh, that newspapers were losing from Craigslist also came as a surprise to publishers, again, who weren't really prepared for what was coming. Um, I had a publisher told me once that you might think that a newspaper makes the most money from a big full page display ad from Macy's or something like that, but actually the most money they make is from a page of classified advertising. All those little classified ads really added up. And when Craigslist came along, you could post them for free. There went that revenue. And of course, like with everything else we talk about these days, COVID-19 had, uh, had a big impact. All of the local businesses which were being shut down obviously had no need to advertise. They had no money to advertise. And that meant that local papers were really beginning to shut down. Um, if, let me know if I'm going too fast. If there are any questions, I tend to run at the mouth a little bit. So uh, if anyone wants a pause, let me know. So before hedge funds, there were corporations. Newspapers used to be owned locally and run locally. The person who started the Mercury is a locally famous person named Shandy Hill. His uh, ghost is still said to haunt the basement of the building uh, at King and North Hanover Streets in Pottstown. Um, but they made money. So corporations took an interest in them and they began putting together chains. You've all heard of Gannett, which runs USA Today. There were other ones like McClatchy and Tribune and, and the one that owns the Mercury. The problem is they weren't really interested in the public service aspect of newspapers. Some of the things that I've talked about earlier, they were interested in, in the making money part. Um, so obviously, uh, that was their that was their primary interest, um, and when some of the things I mentioned before began to happen and revenue began to drop, they weren't worried about preserving their commitment to the community. They were concerned about preserving their profit. So that meant the staff got cut, coverage got cut, and the downward spiral begins. It's at this point that hedge funds enter the picture. Um, you've already had an explanation about how they work, so we may be able to skip through uh, some of this. Um, you all know that, uh, hopefully by now, that they're not regulated by the FEC, that uh, there are fewer rules governing them. And while uh, hedge funds may supposedly be hedging their bets and taking risks, vulture funds like Alden Global Capital, which is the, which is the company that owns the Reading Eagle and, and the Mercury, doesn't really take very big risks because they tend to go after what's called distressed companies because they can get them super cheap and they have perfected a methodology for extracting profit from those companies and they're not at all interested in sustaining them. So Alden Global Capital is a pretty big deal uh, in it's maybe one of the bigger newspaper companies you've never heard of and that's probably because they're a hedge fund. They have a, a a front-facing company called Digital First Media, which is what uh, used to be called Digital First Media, excuse me, now it's called Media News Group. And uh, they operate all the papers and Alden sort of stays in the background and makes all the decisions. Um, they own stakes in, uh, in addition to the Mercury and the Eagle, they uh, own stake in Lee Enterprises. They bought most of that from um, Warren Buffett when he finally decided to sell his shares in that. And right now, the, the big news is that Alden has 32% of the shares in Tribune uh, Company, which is a very big newspaper chain, which owns the Chicago Tribune, which is where the name comes from, um, the Baltimore Sun, the New York Daily News, and they also own the Morning Call in Allentown, if any of you guys are from Allentown. So again, as you've seen, what the hedge funds do and, and Alden's playbook is uh, essentially that any company they buy that uh, is not based in a tax shelter in the Cayman Islands or in the state of Delaware, they move it there. And that means that costs 
all of us money because those companies are no longer paying taxes to the places that they used to be located in. Um, and then after they do that, so they've, they've made revenue from not paying taxes anymore, and then they cut staff, they cut personnel in order to increase their share of the revenue. Uh, there's a quote there from Nicholas Shaxson, who wrote the book from the previous slide. Um, he uh, used to be a reporter for the Financial Times, and uh, he wrote a book about hedge funds, and he devoted an entire chapter to Alden. That's how special they are. Um, this is Heath Freeman and Randall Smith. They are the two people who started Alden Global Capital. Um, and so, as you heard before, they use other people's money to, to buy these companies. So that's why I don't think their risk is very high. They'll put in maybe 2% of their own capital. And then if they keep the, the uh, company going for a year or two, and they make that money back, then everything else they make from that point forward is gravy. Because remember, they have absolutely no interest in sustaining the company and keeping it going. Their only interest in doing that is so that it can continue to generate revenue for them. They don't put any of that profit or revenue back into the company to make it sustainable. It's, uh, as Shaxson says, it's an extraction property. And they do that, uh, as was said previously, um, they, uh, they load the company down with debt once they buy it, and then they start charging these management fees and they use those expenses as a rationale for cutting staff so they can increase profit. How much profit? Quite a bit. Um, so there is a media analyst out there named Ken Doctor, and he has been really very good at uh, predicting trends and what's happening in the newspaper industry, which is really sort of in a high-speed freefall at the moment. And uh, he managed to get his hands on some of the financials from Alden, and um, which is not something that it's easy to do because it's not a publicly held corporation like those traded on Wall Street. And what they found, what he found, was that um, the company was making 17% profit, which is unheard of in the newspaper industry. And the newspapers that are around Philadelphia, they own newspapers in clusters so that they can share content and it still looks like a local paper, um, was making a 30% profit margin, which is ridiculous in an age when newspapers are dying and people are being laid off. But none of that money went back into the newspaper. Instead, they used it to go play in the stock market. They, they bought a couple of companies, one called Fred's Pharmacy, the other one called pay less shoe source. And they essentially, they did the same thing. They ran them into the ground. To Alden, a newspaper is not a, a public benefit. It's just another company, just like a shoe company or a pharmacy. So there's no reason for them to stop what they're doing. They're making tons of money doing it. They are not really worried about the impact it has on the communities, which are losing papers or about the workers who are losing their jobs. So what that means is, is that there are going to be hundreds more Bell Californias all over the country. And, and that's not good for democracy. It means ghost newspapers, which is a term um, that's been coined to describe papers that sort of have the banner and the look of the old paper, but the content is, is from areas that aren't anywhere close to its original coverage here. So journalists responded to this crisis Generally speaking, we really don't like being the story. Our job is to tell the story. And for a long time, journalists resisted the idea of writing about their own problems. However, uh, because the news is so important to democracies, essentially they couldn't hold off much longer. So the Denver Post, which is probably the biggest newspaper by circulation that Alden owns, had what's called the Denver Revolt. And the editors put out an entire special section, Sunday special section, essentially savaging their owners, telling them that they were destroying the newspaper. The graphic here that, they, that you can see there shows the first picture is what the staff used to be. Uh, and then all of those who were lost are blacked out. And what's there is the, is the staff that remains. Um, and so, uh, the other thing that happened is uh, the unions got involved. There's been a huge wave of unionization in newspapers across the country. 
as they go into crisis and it becomes clear that the owners are not interested in sustaining the business at all. They're interested in, in making money and, and they don't care how many people they have to lay off to do that. And so the unions got involved. Uh, I am a member of the newspaper guild, which represents workers at the Mercury and some of the Philadelphia cluster papers. And we're part of a larger umbrella union called the Communication Workers of America. And they use some of the money they collect from the dues they charge us to hire our own investigative reporter. Her name is, is Julie Reynolds, and she is, boy, do we get our money's worth with her. Um, so if you've ever watched a detective show, you've probably seen something they call the crazy wall. You know, it's either a, um, a chalkboard or it's a, a pinup like this, and they're trying to show all the different connections with strings attaching everything. Well, Julie did a crazy wall for Alden, and you can see from how complicated it is that it's a whole web of all these different companies, and um, they all follow the same path. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that Alden is, is, is very particularly doing and is, and is particularly newsworthy today is they'll buy a company, and then they'll sell the building that the newspaper is in to one of their subsidiaries, which is a real estate company. It's what happened at the Mercury. Um, and it's also a, what's about to happen at the Reading Eagle, which I had a story today that says that there is an offer. They are under contract to sell that building right there in downtown. And they'll either sell the building outright or they'll extract money from it by charging ridiculously high rent to the company that they bought and they send it to another company that they own that has nothing to do with the newspaper, one of the real estate uh, holdings. And so that's, that's one of the things that Julie discovered and, and continues to happen. Uh, they do it with the other companies too, not just the newspaper. Um, so Randall Smith made Payless Shoes move its corporate headquarters from Topeka, where it had been for decades when it was founded, down to a building that he owned in Dallas. And he extracted rent from them before that company went under. So why are you hearing all of this from me? Basically, I got pissed off. I read some of Julie's reporting about what was going on at Alden, and I figured my job's going to be gone pretty soon. And the function that I think is so important is going to be gone pretty soon. So why not go out with a bat? So I have family that lives on Long Island, and I read a story that Julie wrote for The Nation magazine, talking about how Heath Freeman, one of Alden's co-founders, was expanding his uh, beach house in the Hamptons. And I thought, let's go pay him a visit. So I went, as this picture shows, just with the idea of taking this picture in his driveway, putting it on social media, everyone's happy. But while I was there, I thought, I knock on people's doors for a living. I go up to strangers all the time and ask them questions. Why should this be any different? So I went up and knocked on his front door. It wasn't very eventful. I got in, he saw me, he saw the shirt I was wearing and he declined to talk to me. But after I wrote about that and after other people wrote about that, um, I caught the interest of other media companies who were trying to tell the story in the same way the Denver Post was. And essentially I became the poster child for trying to save local news. So that involved bringing us back to hedge funds, Julie and I going down to Washington last summer and uh, speaking uh, at a press conference when uh, Elizabeth Warren and a whole bunch of other presidential contenders, Bernie Sanders, I believe, was also a co-sponsor of the bill. They were introducing a bill in the Senate called Stop Wall Street Looting Bill. And the idea was that it was supposed to try and rein in some of the hedge funds, try and impose some rules on them. Um, because essentially there are lots of people who lose their jobs as a result of this profit extraction strategy. And the idea was to put some constraints on them. Um, and the message is starting to get out there, um, particularly at the, at the Tribune company where as soon as Alden bought 33% of the shares and got two seats on the board of directors. All of the journalists went crazy. Two investigative reporters from the Chicago Tribune pulled their money and uh, paid for a full page ad in the New York Times asking for local investors to try to buy the company before Alden gets control of it. 
Um, and now several city councils, which is remarkable when you consider how often newspapers beat up city councils, um, they've all uh, issued statements calling on Alden to, to get out of the news business and um, condemning their practices. And that's going on right now in Allentown. So now you know what we did. If you want to know what you can do, uh, if you're interested in doing something, the uh, crazy part about it is I'm going to tell you to get a subscription to a paper that Alden Global Capital owns. Because even though you're rewarding their strategy, um, you'll also end up keeping a local news source open. And, and that's important, particularly in an election year like this. If you don't have a local newspaper near you, try and find a local news site that follows professional practices. And for God's sake, uh, be an informed news consumer. When you're, on the, when you're on the internet, when you're on social media, don't just share things without trying to do at least some basic checking to see if they're true. Because ultimately, that's what newspapers are about, trying to tell us what's true. And that's important to democracy. So it's time for questions. Or apparently it's time for a quiz. I've launched the quiz. It'll be open for a few minutes. We're gonna take some questions. Um, you can raise your hand using the um, feature down at the bottom, um, or you can call attention in the chat, which I am monitoring. I'm gonna throw out one question to get you started. Could sure. you say a little bit about how many reporters were covering local government when you started at the Mercury? Oh, okay. And how many reporters are covering local government today? Uh, well, the last question is easier to answer because you're looking at them. Um, when I first started in 1997, there were 15 reporters in the Mercury's newsroom. Nine of those were dedicated to municipal beats. There is now one. Uh, and the impact of that, uh, other than making sure everyone feels bad for me, is that um, there are things that don't get covered. So the idea of keeping government accountable becomes harder and harder when there's only one person doing the work. So ultimately, I try and keep an eye on 30 different municipalities, school districts, townships, boroughs, all of them, all of which are in our coverage area. And our expanded coverage area in a local election year, I've kept track of as many as 50. There's no way that you can do that and catch everything. So it becomes much easier for corruption or inefficiency to begin to creep into local government. So we have a question online um, about the best way to support with little or no cost. Um, this person says money is important to newspapers, but they have only $2 to their name. So that limits their... <laughs> um, well, uh, there is actually a movement toward making newspapers nonprofit. Um, and that doesn't mean that you won't have to pay for them. In fact, it probably means you'll have to pay more for them because they are, there are several models out there which are working on trying to get something sustainable that lives completely on subscription revenue or contributions from uh, readers. So if you can find a nonprofit site, you may be able to deduct the cost of your subscription as a donation to a nonprofit entity and so that may make it more affordable, but I don't know if two bucks is going to do it. We also have a question in the Q and A. Um, how did you get your foot in the door of this business, and how is it different nowadays? What advice do you have for aspiring journalists? I'm sorry, uh, Professor Becking, can you see the Q and A? Yes, I didn't okay. notice it, but I can. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I got my foot in the door early. Um, I got started when I was in high school. The, the, the high school newspaper, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember something called mimeographs, perhaps Professor Beckin, Beckin is, but I don't want to assume. Um, so the school newspaper was something that came out on mimeographs about twice a year. And it was ridiculous and it was pathetic. You know, the, the paper that came out in April had the football scores in it and it, it served no purpose. Uh, and so I had a friend who was a very enterprising young man who knew someone at a printing uh, company up in Maine who said that if we sent him the material, he could print up a newspaper for us. So that's what we did. 
um, we started a, a free newspaper called the Free Press. Uh, the first edition came out. We went in at five o'clock in the morning into the school and we dropped bundles of it in the hall. It was quite the hit. We did not put our names on it. We did not use bylines. And um, that made the high school administration very frustrated because they wanted to know who was doing this. Um, by the second edition, we were using bylines and the second edition was also the last edition. Uh, after that, um, I, was, I had gotten a taste for it. Um, my stepmother uh, is uh, a former reporter herself and uh, she was one of the women who broke the glass ceiling at a newspaper in Albany, uh, a now defunct newspaper called the Knickerbocker News. Um, and I asked her what that was like. I was watching a, a program called Lou Grant, which is about a newspaper in Los Angeles. And I was enjoying it. And I asked her, is, is this what it's like to be a reporter? She said, that's exactly what it's like. And I said, well, that works for me. And, and the reason was because you really get to do something different every day. Uh, one day you're covering spot news. Another day you're doing a feature story on, on a homeless person. Another day you might be... Uh, uncovering wrongdoing by public officials. It's always interesting. You won't get rich. Um, as for the advice part of the question, uh, <laughs> referring to how you won't get rich, my first piece of advice might be, don't become a journalist because you're not gonna make a lot of money. But if you're determined to do it, uh, the best way to do it is to try and get in with the local paper if you have one or a local news site if you have one because that will get you clips and experience. Um, I actually got myself a job at a local paper by doing the work without getting paid. I applied for a job and they said they didn't have any openings. And so I began going to the meetings and writing up a story that night and bringing it in to the editor the next day and saying, is this better with, than what's in your paper? And that's how I got a job back. Well, Megan asked what inspired you to continue and you may have spoken to that. Kyle asks about different models that news companies and journals could use to sustain themselves and other ways that we could support them. Right. Um, well, I, I keep doing it because I think it's important. Uh, and also thanks to the fact that I'm in a union, uh, I have a, a living wage, I'm not getting rich, but I, I have a house, I raised a son, I'm putting him through college. And uh, that's not easy to do at a lot of newspapers that don't have union representation. So one, the short answer, I guess, is because I can. Um, the second question I think is, is, is very important and one that I've been looking at because I don't really think that the mercury is necessarily going to last for another 10 years. And so I started asking myself the question, what do you do when it's gone? How do the people in Pottstown get the, get the local news that they need? So I have been investigating other methodology. I'm, I'm very interested in the, in the nonprofit model. You can, you can do it either way. Um, there are places that are just an online news site, which are managing to sustain themselves. There are others where started as a local newspaper and, and their website has become the primary delivery system. Um, there's a lot of different models out there. The one that I'm partial to uh, is, is a nonprofit model. And uh, one of the places I was investigating, um, the editor said that they, they, stopped, they stopped covering breaking news car crashes and arrests and things like that because it got eyeballs, but it didn't get readers. No one who wanted to read that news actually wanted to pay for it. They wanted to find out about the spectacular thing that happened that day. Because of course, uh, you know, when, when we survived on print revenue, we knew what sold papers and what didn't and government coverage usually didn't do it. But the people who were willing to pay for it, the people who could sustain the company, are people who are more interested in the type of work that I do in the municipal coverage and, and holding public officials accountable. So that's something that I may be pursuing in coming years uh, when or uh, if or when the mercury goes away. Um, but there are a lot of models out there. Um, there is an organization called IRE, which used to be the Investigative Reporters um, Institute or something like that. Um, they've now shifted and they now actually offer a, a boilerplate uh, online news site model. You can be a nonprofit 
you, you pay them uh, something like five or 10% of your revenues. You exist under their tax-free designation site, so you don't have to go through the process of setting all of that up. It, it, it can be done, but on a much smaller scale, which is actually what worked best to begin with before the corporations got involved and, and, and tried to, to make more money out of scale. I hope that answers your question. I'm going to shut down the poll in another 30 seconds. There's only three people who haven't done it. Sierra says, with this year being an election year, are there any topics newspapers stray from um, or for that matter, make more prominent? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by stray from. I think avoid is what she. Oh, there's, there's lots of voids. Um, local papers to a large extent are much more important during local election years, um, but they, they can have an impact on national elections when there's enough staff and enough time. Um, when uh, George W. Bush was running for the first time, uh, I ran a series of issue articles, um, picking out several that I thought would be important to the readers and, and showing the positions, just using the position papers on their websites from both sides to help inform people about how each candidate uh, approached a particular problem. That's something that local newspapers could and should be doing, but they really aren't, largely because there just isn't enough staff. And Amelia asks whether hedge funds often sway a newspaper politically, um, putting certain stories in as filler or just using any stories or? Well, they do use a lot of filler. Uh, and they, they do do something called copy sharing, which is where the ghost newspaper phrase comes from. Uh, and that was something that was imposed at the Mercury as, and that's one of the reasons that they have this cluster strategy for their newspapers. So the Mercury covers parts of Montgomery, Berks, and Chester County. So we take Chester County news from the daily local news in Westchester. We take Berks County news from the Reading Eagle. We take some Montgomery County news from newspapers further east that cover down near the main line or down in Lansdale. And, and those are all used to fill the newspaper. We never used to run that sort of stuff before. However, in, that's, that was a cost saving measure. It wasn't because they thought it would be a better news strategy. My experience at least has been that they just don't care what's in the newspaper as long as the checks come rolling in. Um, I've, I've said several times that there are newspaper companies and there are companies that own newspapers. Uh, Alden, at least in this case, is the latter. Um, they also own pharmacies. They also own chains or shoe stores. To them, the newspaper is just another business that they extract money from. So they pay absolutely zero attention to what's in it. Otherwise, there is no way that the folks at the Denver Post could have had a whole special section saying how bad that Alden Global Capital was uh, if they had been paying any kind of attention. So for the most part, I would say no. Um, they, some may, that, that more often happens when you have a single wealthy owner who wants a newspaper as much for the bragging rights. Uh, I have a friend who works at the Gazette in Colorado Springs, which is the second largest newspaper in that state. And that's owned by a billionaire. And he has a lot to say about the content of that newspaper. We have time for a couple more questions. How has Alden responded um, to your efforts? I did see an unkind comment about you in one of the newspaper articles. <laughs> um, for the most part, they've ignored it. Uh, ignored me, um, which is which is fine with me. As as a member of a union, um, I have certain protections. You're allowed to talk about your working conditions uh, under federal law, and so as long as I'm doing my job and I'm not stealing money and I'm not trying to get overtime and I'm not having them sued for libel, they can't fire me for speaking out against them. I'm I'm pretty sure they're not happy about it, but they've mostly. Um, left it alone. In fact, uh, the only response that they ever got to any of the activism that I've, that I've uh, undertaken, Dan Barry got in the article in the New York Times when he asked them for comment 
And the only thing that they chose to comment on was, was nothing about my criticism of their strategy, nothing about what they were doing to newspapers. The only thing they chose to comment on is the fact that I went out to visit Heath Freeman at his beach house and they didn't think that was very nice. But they invited you in. The maid invited me in. <laughs> uh, she didn't realize what she was doing when she did. So you're the only person covering local government, but you're not the only reporter. What does um, Alden see as important in a newspaper? They don't. Um, all of the reporters that we still have are essentially legacy. We have them because we always have them. So, oh, let me, one correction. They do think local sports is important. They do think that that sells newspapers. So the only department uh, in our newspaper that has ever replaced someone who left or quit was the sports department. But they're not exactly flush either. There's one editor and, and two reporters that are covering uh, scholastic sports in, in nine different school districts and a handful of parochial schools, um, as well as, as running a website. Uh, there's myself. Um, we used to have a police reporter, but I'm now also the police reporter. And we have uh, the only guy who's been a reporter longer than me in the news department is a fellow named Carl Hessler. And he's the courts reporter. He covers all of the courts down in Norristown for Montgomery County. And I don't count him fully because although we pay his salary, he doesn't write just for us. He covers cases uh, that would run in newspapers that are not the Mercury, for the Lansdale Reporter, for the Times Herald in Norris, Norristown, for a bunch of other weeklies that they have around Montgomery County. So he covers them too. So he, all of his time is not devoted to simply putting stories in the Mercury. So uh, although I don't think he'd like me to say it, I sort of consider him to be a half reporter in the county of the Mercury's staff. So how many of your stories appear in other newspapers um, in this cluster? Quite a few. Um, I get email from, from people from all over the place saying that they read a story in a newspaper that I've never even heard of. And it's, you know, one of the, one of the ghost weeklies that we own that mm. used to be an independent and is now combined with three other weeklies, the, the Times item news, you know, 16 different uh, ampersands. Have the deadlines, um, this page size, you know, the quantity of pages, how has the paper changed in the last 10 years, say, since Alden took it over from Journal Register? Well, one of the things that Alden did, which I actually didn't disagree with, is they consolidated press operations. Each of the newspapers used to have its own press. Ours was built in the 30s. The fact that we were getting color pages out of it was a miracle, and they didn't look so good. Um, so they consolidated press operations down in Eagle. So the quality of the, of the, of the physical product looked better. However, um, when you only have one press and you're, and you're publishing eight to 10 different newspapers every day, you can't do them all at the same time. So that affects your deadlines because everything has to get pushed back so that first you do one newspaper and you print all of those and then you do the other. So we used to be very late in line and our, and our deadline used to be about 11 o'clock which was fine with us. It allowed us to get in late breaking news, news from meetings, and especially on election night, we usually had some, some pretty complete results that would be out in the paper the next day. However, when they bought the Eagle, which has a much larger circulation than the Mercury, we got pushed back. And they have much earlier deadlines now, about eight o'clock. Um, and, and no one told me about it and I didn't realize it. So uh, if any of you remember the really bad flooding that occurred not this summer, but the, the July before, particularly along Manitoni Creek, I was out covering that. I was, I was wading through uh, flood water, holding my iPhone as high as I could so it didn't get wet, shooting video, interviewing people. It was, it was horrible flooding. They were evacuating houses all over the place. It was about six o'clock and I hurried back to my little attic here to, and I let my editor know that, that I had this amazing story and his answer was, the paper's already gone to press. There's nothing you can do. So the next day, we had a lead story about a police dog, and everyone in Pottstown was, was saying, what the hell? There was a major flood here. 
last night and there's nothing about it in the local paper. We put stuff online, but we didn't have anything, you know, as far as deadlines are concerned, there isn't a deadline for online, but there was nothing in the paper uh, for two days. It was two days after the flooding that we actually had some coverage, which I felt was pretty embarrassing. Amelia asks a very interesting question. Me follows with that because Alden used to call this operation digital first, and I don't remember the websites being particularly <laughs> first. But she asked about whether Alden and companies like it go after online news as well, or are they really focused on the print product? They were focused on the print product primarily because it's a known entity and the digital market at this point, there's so much flux. You know, we talked about the fact that hedge funds are supposed to take risk, but they don't take too much risk. The, the digital first entity is actually pre-Alden. Um, before Alden got involved, uh, my newspaper was owned by a company called the Journal Register Company, which was equally notorious for cost cutting. Um, and they did, went through bankruptcy at least twice. And after the second bankruptcy, um, they appointed a fellow named John Payton as the CEO and as the chairman of the board. And he at least was trying to save local news in, in some way or another. So he's the person who changed the name to Digital First Media because he said, you know, we can't keep relying on print. We need to get better at doing digital. And for a while we did, and we were trying, uh, but it still wasn't producing the revenue to sustain the company. And, and that's when Alden stepped in and, and bought out a major share. So they, they, they kept the name, but it's largely meaningless in terms of the corporate strategy. And I know a lot of my students believe that print is dying and they don't understand why we keep printing papers. But there is, of course, a reason why Alden keeps printing papers, right? They make money. They still make money. Uh, and interestingly, to Amelia's point, um, one of the things that was on the, uh, on the presentation, but I think I skipped it, uh, Julie Reynolds, the Guild's investigative reporter, recently uh, got her hands on some internal memos that showed that during the, the, when the pandemic first started and our revenues started to drop off the map, the immediate panic response was to start laying off journalists and or giving them uh, unpaid weeks, furloughing them for a week, a month, uh, without pay in order to try and save money. But what they found, and kind of uh, backs up the point I've been trying to make all night, was that when people needed it, they went to the newspaper, they went to the website, because they really wanted to find out what was happening locally, what schools were closed, uh, where they uh, could get medical treatment. Uh, we had a lot of coverage of what was going on in hospitals and whether or not they were going to get overwhelmed if, if, the, if the virus got out of control. People wanted to know this stuff. It was literally a matter of life and death. And suddenly they were willing to pay the digital subscription cost. It's only 10 bucks a month. Um, and so even though they were laying off the people who provide all of that information, Alden was actually making more money than it had expected to as a result of the increased website presence. Not very many newspapers actually do make money on their online presence. And so no. I'm sure it was a surprise to Alden. Um, I, I think it was, I mean, it's, it's, well, the New York Times makes money in its online presence and, and just recently uh, its revenues for digital and its circulation for digital uh, finally surpassed its print circulation. Um, but for a long time, there was, this, I, there was this resistance to the idea that you should charge for the content, which I never understood. I asked the question a couple of times and got shouted down by people who said they knew more than me and I assumed they were right. Um, you pay for a copy of the paper. You pay for a subscription. Why wouldn't you pay online? And in large part, it was because there had been this culture that everything on the web is free. And so you're really going to to make people unhappy if, if you start charging them. And really all we did was train them to expect it for free, which is you know, one of the ways that has nothing to do with hedge funds and the ways that newspapers shot themselves in the foot. We have time for one more question, I think. My favorite ice cream is peach. <laughs> Hi, 
No business related questions? The communication students have been doing awesome. Hmm? Would you like to offer the last question? I... <laughs> this is why the business students aren't coming up with questions. I can't come up with a, a decent one that hasn't been answered yet either. <laughs> I do have another journalism question, but you know, there could be something about the future of hedge funds or something, you know? I mean, yeah, it's, it's well, I, this idea of, of uh, taking over a small kind of company, a com the idea is that it provides a source of liquidity, go out. If you can't get loans from any other resource, that's why hedge funds are looking into this is just because, um, you know, the cash strap, go out cash draft sorry their father's supposed to be watching them um he's in trouble now <laughs> a cash draft organization that you know doesn't have access to funds in the regular capital market because of a poor credit rating a hedge fund would be able to step in and take them on or the even worse side of the hedge fund is the idea that because there are no regulations, they can buy you and then simultaneously short your shares, which, uh, you know, which is basically bet against the company. So do you think that there should be, well, obviously you do think there should be specific regulations against this, especially given, um, you know, the need for small papers to report on local elections, local government, those kinds of right. things, which are critical. I'm not, uh, so the short answer is yes, but, um, and, and I said this when I was in Washington, um, we shouldn't be amazed that Wall Street is, is pursuing profit. That, that's, that's what it exists to do. I mean, I think the real question that we need to start asking ourselves is, should they be involved in something that is dedicated to democracy and the common good the way that local news is? Well, I don't know if you prevent that through um, through regulation. I don't know if you change that through providing better alternatives, um, you know, after they've, they've killed off the papers, because they will. I just, I, I mean, as much as we, in, in my particular group, as we rail against the uh, ownership by hedge funds, they're sharks. And don't swim with sharks if you don't want to get eaten. And, and so, but the, the hedge funds, they've got, they're very interested now the, the largest merger uh, happened this year for newspapers. Uh, Gannett merged with Gatehouse, which are two of the biggest newspaper companies. And the only way that it happened was a different hedge fund. Alden tried very hard to get a piece of that action, but they were, they were rebuffed be, in part because their reputation is so horrible, thanks to us. But um, there's, an, there's another less well-known hedge fund called Fortress Investments, which, which funded that merger and the the loan is in the billions but the but the real crime is that the interest that they're charging this newly merged company is something like 11 or 12 percent and so they are going to make money no matter what happens it's 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 not a strategy that's designed to keep those two companies up and running and providing people with news it's a way to take advantage of two companies which are in distress and make a little money before you kill them off. And actually a lot of the corporate investments, I mean, a lot of newspapers, the Philadelphia Inquirer, for example, sold because in corporate investors weren't happy with it only making 12%. Right. And so it was sold off for quite a large hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars. And its most recent sale through after two bankruptcies was more in the $12 million range. But, you know, huge amounts of wealth, um, accumulated operations, their buildings, such mm -hmm. for lost in the process. Yes, completely devalued. Um, and interesting now, the, the Inquirer and the Daily News are, are owned by the Lenfest Foundation. It's, it's an experiment in, in nonprofit news. Um, and uh, interestingly, they're still having disputes and in, uh, in, in contract negotiations with their union. So no matter who owns the company, reporters want to get paid a living wage. Um, so whether it's a hedge fund or a more benevolent 
nonprofit foundation, the same issues still remain. And it really illustrates the, the difficulties in, in, in trying to sustain this. Uh, I should mention also that, uh, that my union, in fact, this evening, uh, I, I missed their presentation to give this one. Um, they're involved in a campaign called Save the News, and they're trying to get uh, some of the um, some of the money that the federal government is giving out for COVID relief to go to newspapers. And some of us have some mixed feelings about that because, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the importance of remaining independent from the government, and and how do you then go in and start reporting on all of the horrible things Congress is doing when you just took a big fat handout from them a few months earlier. But uh, again, everyone's looking for a way to try and maintain this function. And, and really, it's the question is, how do you fund it? How do you pay the people who do the work that bring you this information that you need in order to be an informed voter? Well, thank you. Um, we, I do have an exit survey that is um, set up, which according to the prompts is going to launch as soon as we end. So you should watch for that and fill it out. Um, Amelia did have a question about something specific you don't like doing when reporting, which is sort of a different direction than we've been talking, but. What's, what's the question? Is there something specific you don't like doing when you're reporting? Um, I don't like making mistakes, um, and and that happens with alarming frequency. Um, I I don't like some of the more sensational. Actually, I don't really like spot news at all. Um, it gets it gets a lot of eyeballs, and it sustains uh, uh, the subscription certainly. But I I don't care for it. Um, I'm much more interested in policy and government and. Uh, when you cover spot news, there's a whole lot of standing around. Um, I'm not sure the business students will know what spot news is. Uh, spot news is is something that is unexpected that happens. So there's a car crash, there's a fire, there's a shooting. Usually it's things that involve the police or involve the fire department. And you, you drop whatever you're doing and you rush out to go to the scene and to take pictures um, and you put them on Twitter and, and thousands of people get, it's, it, there's a, a big adrenaline rush. And there are a lot of reporters who like to do that. Um, I'm not one of them, partially because I'm getting older now and I don't rush anywhere all that well. Uh, but also because I don't think it's the primary function of a free press. It, it, it feels um, a little bit like, uh, like you're rubbernecking uh, in, a, in a traffic jam. So, so I don't care for it as much. Well, thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Evan. And thank you. It's been fun. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. So, how do I.